if you are doing a an SMP or a post back to improve your grades, don't apply to medical school while you're in that program. Mission accepted season two, episode two. We're dealing with deuces today. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Dr. Gray? I am wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on, sharing your story, sharing your success. Congratulations for getting into medical school and and starting that wonderful journey. Uh, But thank you for coming on and and sharing with kind of the the world, if you want to call it that, Um, your your story, your your application, and, and helping others who are following in your footsteps realize that maybe even after mistakes are made, and we'll see some mistakes with maybe your GPA as we look look forward, um, that you can still get into medical school. Surprise, surprise. Who knew that you don't have to be a perfect student to get into medical school? Um, before we jump in and take a look of your, at your application, I want to hear from you kind of your reflection or maybe talking to admissions committees, uh, people that, that you interviewed with. Uh, what was it you think that ultimately earned you those interviews and, and ultimately an acceptance to medical school? I think, um, so I believe that working hard is way more important than smarts um, for medical school. So demonstrating and having a history of perseverance and grit in your application, I think really helps and really telling your thought process and the things that you've done along the way to really demonstrate your commitment to medicine and the healthcare field. So I think those were probably the key points that were beneficial for in my application. All right. And and I I think those are awesome, fair points that a lot of students listening will go, that's BS. There's something else in your application. Like Medical schools want perfect students, 4.0 students, perfect MCAT scores. They, 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 that's what they care about. They don't care about anything else. And it's just, it's this constant fight that I have to have of like, no, like you're not listening. There is more to life than a 4.0, 525 MCAT score. 528 will go all the way. 528 MCAT score uh, to get into medical school, and and it's it's funny the way that you said that, right? This perseverance uh, is key. And a lot of students are like, well, what what should I do? Should I just go fail a semester to show that I can bounce back? I'm like, no, like don't add stress into your life just to show perseverance. Just tell your story at the end of the day. We're all dealing with stuff. We all have our own struggles and our own journeys. And and maybe you think you don't and, and you're blessed if you if you think you don't. Um, but we all have these these stories to tell. And so I'm I'm glad that you're on to to share that story. So Let's go ahead, take a look at your application, and then we'll, we'll talk throughout the, the time. So pulling up your application, the first thing I see here is that compared to what I typically recommend, you have a very late submission date for your AMCAS application. Tell me, why why did you apply so late to, to the MD schools? Yeah, so um, I guess we'll get into it probably a little bit later too, but I, because of my undergrad GPA, I had already decided to do a, a SMP mm-hmm. with linkage to a lo- local school. Um, and my thought, and there wasn't enough information out there to really uh, give me a good idea which way to go. But my thought was to uh, wait till my first semester grades had come out. Um, and therefore, if I had submitted too early, they would be sending out interviews before I can give an update. Yep. Um, I think ultimately, that was probably not the best decision. So um I don't know. I would like to kind of discuss that with you, Dr. Gray, about how you would tackle that yeah. situation. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great point to make, and we can talk about it now. So let me let me scroll down and just and just show this timeline of of when you were doing your um, your postback classes here. So um, you're talking about the Heritage University SMP, correct? So on your application here. You have here that you were doing it 2020 to 2021. Um, talk about when did you start classes for your SMP? SMP, I believe, started in August. Okay. In August of? 2020. August of 2020, which is when you applied to medical school. And so it's very common for students to go into a post program or an SMP and want to apply to medical school at the same time. 
And a lot of times I will say, don't do that. Because the whole reason you're applying or, or going to an SMP program is to show that you are academically capable of doing well in medical school. And if you apply to medical school before your kind of totality of more courses are able to be completed to show that you are academically capable, what you are betting on is that schools will take updates. And I don't like to take that bet because medical schools are inundated with thousands upon thousands of applications. And you can't bet on a school taking your email, phone call, whatever it is, and saying, hey, I just want to let you know I've been in an SMP program and I have a 4.0 GPA through my SMP program or whatever it is. Uh, just to let you know, I, I'm not a dumb dumb like my my other grades show me or show show maybe show that I am, right? And and it's it's I I'm a huge tech nerd and and there's this saying in the tech world of never buy a product with a promise of an update in the future. A lot of companies, especially new companies, say, "Ooh, we have this new promising update that's coming, but we're releasing this new thing as is, but we promise that new thing's coming." Never buy a product based on what's coming. And so taking that same kind of analogy, whether you like it or not, is if you are doing a an SMP or a post back to improve your grades, don't apply to medical school while you're in that program. And, and the problem with that is, is it wastes time, right? I don't think it wastes time. I think it's putting together a stronger application the first time without the need of an admissions committee to hopefully take your email or phone call and actually work that into their decisions about your academic capabilities. So that that's my thought process on that. Yeah, I, I think I agree. Okay. All right. So as we continue on, that that makes sense. Um, that little bit of a later application, busy with school and other stuff going on. Uh, we look at uh, kind of your grades, and, and you mentioned. You, you needing to do an SMP because of poor undergrad grades. And we can kind of see just scrolling through your grades at UW that's like, oh yeah, like there's there's some issues here. What do you think it was in your undergraduate process where you weren't finding academic success? What do you think was going on? I just wasn't devoted to school. I was preoccupied with other things. Um, I had recently come back from a year abroad and I am... Um, I guess I just wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I had, you know, personal pressure to to do certain things, um, and I didn't have a true purpose in doing it. So I really believe, believe in having finding your purpose, um, and so I just spent my time doing other stuff. You know, okay. I literally didn't. Yeah, all okay. I did was show up for, for exams. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and it looks like from your classes that you were interested in some sort of science path. It looks like a very traditional kind of pre-med journey. Were you pre-med at the time or thinking about some yeah. other science field? Yeah, I, I was pre-med at the time. Okay. Um, okay. And we can see the timeline here is it looks like you graduated in 2011 and then maybe you actually didn't graduate because there's some extra classes here later on in 2016, 2017. Um, talk about that that kind of delay in in classes and taking time off what were you doing during that time uh to to to, to just be a, a human and, and be out in the world um so i actually didn't didn't finish my degree initially right uh so i um and around 2011 is when i decided you know I, this part isn't for me i i'm just kind of digging myself into a deeper hole mm -hmm. so i throughout the whole college career i was working part-time and then from 2011, I really devoted myself to working full time. Um, I found a, a few jobs. One, one as a phlebotomist, and then I was working multiple jobs. And eventually, I landed into my kind of first career, if you want to call it. Um, and and I did that for a few years before really finding my way back into medicine. So, um, and, and through that process, I finished my degree. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and you can see just looking at here, kind of senior year, it looks like you had just given up at some point with lots of F's in here. And we're just like, I I'm done. This isn't for me. 
Uh, unfortunately, those grades are on there. I, I recommend anyone in, in similar situations, please withdraw from your classes so that you don't have Fs. Uh, a semester of Ws is much, much better uh, than a semester of Fs. Uh, you'll still have to answer some questions potentially, but man, those Fs really sting when it comes to GPA calculations. Um, and then we see 2018, 2019, this reboot right? Uh, student 2.0 coming, going, okay, there's there's some clarity here. Do you think you learned how to be a better student? You came in with new study techniques, or was there just clarity with who you are and what you wanted to do with your life? I think clarity and maturity helps a lot in academic success. So knowing what I wanted to do and knowing um, kind of how to do it. And I also had work experience in how to handle um, multiple priorities and, and prioritizing, juggling different um, tasks that need to be done. So I think it's mostly maturity that helped me. Um, yeah. I don't know if I changed much other than the fact that I actually did study. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, I can't be too much of a help there. And yeah. I think everybody has a so I do their stuff and, and everybody has a study technique that works for them. So yeah. find it first and then study well. Nice. Okay. Awesome. So some more maturity, which is great. Um, all right. And then we can see on here, again, because you applied pre kind of grades, your your graduate, your SMP stuff is not in here, uh, which is what it would look like normally. And so we get to your, your grades here. Uh, obviously, very big downward trend in your grades uh, from undergraduate, your post back GPA, 4.0, your graduate GPA not included here. Talk about the the process of updating schools as you were going through your SMP. What did that look like? And do you think there was any action of like, I, I sent an update to the school and then the next day I got an interview invite. Do you think there was any correlation between updates and, and activity on your application? There is a little bit. I don't think updates really moved the needle too much. Um, so what I did was I... I think I tailored my school list pretty well. And then I emailed every school um, asking their policy, the ones that didn't explicitly state it on their mm -hmm. uh, website. Um, and then most of them had a pretty well listed of you update here and this is what you do. So I followed through and did that as soon as my unofficial transcript from my first semester came out and I sent it in. Um, really the only movement I got were from my state schools. So I would say that's that's where you would focus if you wanted to send updates. Um, other schools probably are not as uh, impacted by any updates. Yeah, I, I again, going back to my original statement, schools just, the admissions offices are usually very lightly staffed um, to, to get the job done. And just, they, they have so much paperwork coming in with the, the primary, secondary, letters of rec, thank you notes coming in post interview, like to, to deal with update letters from the 8,000 students applying it's just really hard to do and probably why most schools just don't accept updates. They're like, don't bother me. I don't have time. It's not going to help you. <laughs> leave, leave us alone. Um, and so I, that's where that whole like, don't apply with the hope of sending updates to fix something in a weaker primary application. If, if you're thinking about doing that, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to just wait a year to apply the next cycle. So we, we get past your grades and we go, holy moly, you smoked the MCAT. <laughs> what do you think led to so much success on the MCAT? Uh, so I think the best way to tackle the MCAT is practice, practice, practice. Yeah. Um, I bought the blueprint um, test pack and I bought the Altius test pack. Okay. I didn't use all of the tests, but I would say that they greatly contributed to my success. Um, I think testing is probably one of the best ways to gauge where you're at and also content review and getting familiar with the test and getting pacing down and all, basically it's the best way of practicing the test, right? So I did all that and then I did all the AMC material. Um, so, just practice problems. Practice they can only problems. Test it. Yeah. They can only test you so many ways. And once you've seen it all, then you're good to go. Yeah. And, and I think that's such a, a key thing that students, no matter how many times we, we scream from the rooftops through the MCAT podcast, MCAT cars podcast, wherever, 
that the MCAT is is not a, a content test. It's a critical thinking and analysis test. And as soon as you click with how they're asking you the questions and what they are expecting you to, to know and what they're expecting you to pick up from a passage or a question stem, then all of a sudden it's like, it's like when Neo finally sees the matrix. He's like, oh my gosh, I, I can see it. I'm in control here, right? And I'm so excited for the new Matrix movie coming out. Um, so uh, just a, a nerd reference there. Um, but that's exactly what happens. And I've talked to so many students who have that same kind of uh, thought process. They crush the MCAT and they just go, I just figured it out, right? I finally figured out what they're trying to, to ask. Um, and unfortunately, not every student gets to that point because they're so bogged down into reading and reading and reading and reading. And I need to understand all of these things. I'm like, just understand the test at the end of the day. So really good feedback there. Awesome. Yeah, I would add one more point to yeah. that. Um, I think the MCAT is actually pretty good practice for um, med school in that you are asked to filter out the important stuff from the unimportant. Yeah. So when when practicing or studying, um, practice that. Yeah, it's that's a, a key thing in, in being a physician is is what's noise and what's important. So that's uh, really good good feedback there. So then we get to your activity list. Do you think there are anything? Is there anything in your activities that that stood out for you? And I don't really like using that term of like standing out on an application, but maybe something that interviewers brought up of like, oh my gosh, this is really interesting. Um, I think definitely the most interesting part was my search and rescue experience. Uh, I think that's a a good combination of somewhat clinical community service um, and also just showing who you are, your interests and hobbies. Um, so I would say that was probably my most interesting um, experience that was talked about the most. Okay. And for me, it's it's because it's kind of like my spark to get back into medicine. Yeah. It was also a good talking point. Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And and in the news these days with a, a big uh, public and nationwide kind of search for a, a missing woman, unfortunately, who was who was just recently found potentially. So, um, all right. So looking through your, your kind of first one here, a medical mission volunteer um, going to El Salvador. And, and what I love here is that you didn't try to sell, you didn't try to just talk about job duties. You have this l lovely kind of uh, uh, description that I can picture of the line wrapped around the church and into the sunrise. Like right off the bat, I'm excited to continue reading all of your other activities and to get to your personal statement because I'm hoping that my senses are going to be engaged like this the whole rest of the time. Did you purposefully try to write in this kind of creative way to, to engage senses? Where, where did you get that from? Well, so I read your book about personal statements, which is very helpful. And I would recommend everybody who's listening to read Dr. Gray's books. He summarizes and condenses all the vast amount of knowledge about the process down into very uh, digestible chunks. Um, with good examples. So through your exa through your book, I I was kind of lost going into this how to write my activities or personal statement. Um, but through that, I, I kind of took it in a different way of um, really describing from from a storytelling narrative perspective. So. Yeah, that that's awesome. And and prior to your application or or post your application, my my newest book has has come out with ha which has a ton of of experience descriptions and and feedback on those. So, uh, thanks thanks for that little promotion there. Um, so yeah, I think you did a wonderful job just uh, talking about the impact, showing and and really helping the reader understand who you are through this process. Uh, we have shadowing, which is great um, as you as you're going through this process. It doesn't need anything fancy, storytelling or anything. It's just here's a list of of things that I did and what I saw. Your emergency department technician job here. Um, you have stat triage is called out overhead. I rush to wheel Bob into a room. I, I'm excited. I, I want to keep reading. It's like I'm reading a novel. It's not over the top. It's just right. I can understand what's going on. One of the biggest uh, issues that students have with this, though, is sometimes they just do all story 
and don't do any reflection. And so when we get to your most meaningful remarks here, and we kind of see here, we have watching physicians from four different specialties work together to solve this pressing issue, imparted to me the collaborative nature of medicine, each offered their expertise, et cetera, et cetera, right? You, you got out of storytelling mode, and you said, here's why this is important to me. And that's something that students hear my story, story, story kind of message, and they go over the top story, and then they don't reflect on it and tell me why it's important. So you did a great job here. You have a ski patroller here. And that, again, another great story of, of Tim uh, uh, getting his arm broken. Um, and so again, I can, I can see you, I can see what's going on, I can feel the energy and empathy and compassion and everything coming out through these stories. So right off the bat, again, I'm, I'm excited. I can understand who you are a little bit more. And it's not just, as a ski patroller, I would ski down the mountain and look for people and I would use my great uh, attention to detail, right? I don't need any of that. I just wanna know who you are, what you did, what the impact was. Uh, Special Olympics volunteer, uh, again, just kind of good stories going on. Swim instructor, good stories going on. I highlighted one part here. It's just a a language thing that was taught to me when I was in school. Um, You have here, it was a challenge communicating with an autistic child. So instead of labeling the child as autistic, the child has autism. So just so just change the words around. Very common thing that I like to che- uh, teach there. So it was a challenge communicating with a child who has autism or uh, suffering from autism or whatever language you want, although suffering uh, I don't typically like either. Um, so just a small small thing there. And then you have uh, this clinic volunteer, S- SKC clinic volunteer. And you gave great numbers here, right? Sometimes it's not a great clinical experience story that you can tell interacting with a patient, but you can show impact in other ways. And you do this. Over four days, the clinic saw 4,345 individuals, provided over $3.7 million in dental vision and medical care. Perfect. I can see and feel so much impact from that one sentence. So great job with this. Uh, Again, um, medical support technician, another great story that you're telling. King County Explorer Search and Rescue. Again, 300 missions that you receive each year. I can see a number. I can see the impact you've had. Another great story. So I get through these and I'm like, this is awesome. I can see you. I can hear you. I can feel you. I can understand you. I can see the impact that you are having on these. Not just as a search and rescue person, we get calls and we go out and we do this and we create a grid and we go like, I don't need to know those tiny details. I just want to know the impact you've had and you're able to do those things, which is awesome. Um, All right. So we continue and then we get program manager from Amazon. And some people are like, well, why are you putting program manager from Amazon? That's not related to medicine. And oh my gosh, you marked it as a most meaningful, like that's a no, no, right? That most meaningful should be clinical or medical. And you, you have this on here, which is great. I love it. Most meaningful for AMCAS and for TMDSAS to me are most meaningful to your life as a person. What has impacted you the most as a person, not what is leading you to medicine. So great job um, putting this on your application. Obviously, it's a big gap in time, lots of hours. It shows me what you've been doing between school and now kind of coming back to school. Um you didn't try to sell skills. Uh, you, you have some some good leadership stuff here about as your career advanced, beginning to help others, finding their talents. I see some leadership there without going, I built my leadership skills, right? You don't need to sell those specific things. Um, again, hydroelectric project manager. Like, what can I talk about as a hydroelectric project manager? And then you just start off with the air crackled with static electricity. We all have heard static electricity if we like pull a towel out of the dryer and it's crackling and sparking. And so it just brings back so many kind of uh, senses of, of both hearing that sound of popping and seeing the little lightning bolts <laughs> between the fabrics, right? We, we can see that. And again, just great job with that. So I just, I loved your writing throughout your activity descriptions. It really helps me understand who you are, what you've been doing, the impact that you had, 
without you needing to say, I am the most compassionate person in the world. I am the hardest working person in the world. I have this skill and that skill and this skill and that skill. Right? You didn't do that and it wasn't necessary to do it. So great job through all those activities. Any other points you want to make through the activity section? Start early. I think <laughs> writing these things were, it's were hard. very difficult. Yeah. Um, and I would say write it, come back to it later, and then rewrite it. Uh, and it, it took me countless, countless drafts and yeah. edits and, and revisions and feedback from other people. So Yeah. I, I think writing the activity descriptions is harder than the personal statement because the space is so limited. There's so much mm -hmm. to say in so, such a little space. So let's get to personal statement. And here, I think very similar to uh, episode one of season two of Mission Accepted, the personal statement is a little bit of a letdown after all of the, the great activity descriptions. There's some things with the personal statement I think we can learn from, but at the end of the day, it did the job. And it wasn't a letdown in terms of where students normally go wrong with a personal statement that we see on application renovation, there's just, I think, a lot of distraction and maybe stuff that's not needed for a personal statement. So we um, we start here by talking about your grandfather, growing up with your grandfather, hearing stories of uh, enlisting in the resistance, which is kind of fun, little Star Wars kind of, uh, uh, kind of picture that I'm getting. Um, and then he and my grandfather became, uh, grandmother became physicians, returned to heal our decimated hometown of uh, Nanjing. Is that how you say that? Um, yeah. And then you have this kind of tradition of service, which I think is a little cliche, a little overused of like, oh, to be a physician, it's all about service. Um, but there's a little bit of a seed there for you of, okay, my grandparents were physicians, they're here helping, and you see that, you experience that as as a, a, a child. Um, and then you have this uh, nightmare-inducing fever, which is very interesting, that the, the way you bring it up. And again, very, very great kind of descriptive writing. Not over the top, but just helps me understand, right? This was a, a, obviously a very scary moment for you. And so I can I can feel the emotions behind it. Uh, laying helpless in bed and uh, your grandfather becoming champion. So really good kind of story there. Um, this is a great seed that you have here. Um, and so this whole first paragraph, great little seed here. And then we get to... This next paragraph, I have timeline personal stories not specifically related to medicine. And so talk about the the thought process behind this next paragraph where it's like at the age of seven, you immigrated to the US um, and then spending time in Germany and going back and forth. Talk to me about what the goal of this paragraph was for you. Yeah, so I mean, on reflection, I think I set up too much background, but that was the goal was to give a little bit more background on kind of my upbringing and, and how I got to be where I am. Um, probably a little extra. Yeah, it's, it's hard, hard balance to strike, I think, for, yeah. for some, from some people. At least with me, it was very hard. Just I wasn't sure how much, there's so much stuff to do, and then you had to cut it down. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So it's context, right? You wanted to give context about who you are, where you're from, the journey that you've been on. I think that's important and depending on kind of other opportunities, maybe depending on on certain situations, maybe this could have been a disadvantaged essay, um, potentially, depend, depending on specific situations. Uh, or we just cut it down a little bit because I think maybe there's just a lot that that maybe isn't necessary. But it's not terrible. Again, it's, it's not like selling these skills or making super cliche statements about medicine and, and journeys. It's just a lot of background that maybe is not needed. And so I read this and I go, okay, here's a little bit of a distraction. Let's see if we can bring it back to where we need to go. And so we, we get to the third paragraph and then you are in this club uh, introducing the others to the beauty of the Pacific Northwest. And you uh, do this wilderness search and rescue. And, and you're like, oh, like, 
this is kind of interesting. It's kind of along the lines of serving people, helping people. I wanted to be a doctor. And and there's what I call this pivot point in your life of like, oh my gosh, I'm back, right? (laughs) Get out of my way. I'm back. I'm doing this. And so a really good pivot point to help the reader understand maybe why we saw such a drastic change from uh, undergrad student to post back student to to graduate student and and what what kind of changed in your mentality um, you, you have here revealed my purpose in life revive the aspirations I had abandoned in college to restore the injured to health right very basic simple statement that says I'm back right so great job uh, doing that and then and then you get back into okay now I'm gonna water the seed the language that I use in, in the personal statement book is watering the seed and you have this great story about Mr. Lee in the emergency department really helping the reader understand your exposure to medicine what what you like about it what you want to do with your life etc so great story there and then we get to your conclusion. And we have this lovely statement here that says, I aspire to dedicate my career as a physician in addressing the healthcare challenges faced by other immigrants and disadvantaged populations. So really great aspirational statement there. I love the conclusion to be very aspirational in terms of what you hope to accomplish. Uh, the, The language I like to use is tell the school, tell the reader what it is that you're going to do with that piece of paper that they're gonna give you, right? When you get your degree as a physician, what are you going to do with it to make them proud of you? So great little aspirational statement there. And so overall, right, we have really, really excellent activity descriptions. We have a good personal statement with a little bit of a distraction, but overall very good personal statement and a terrible GPA that was saved by, shocker, an upward trend that we talk about all the time, that you don't have to be a perfect student. You have to show that you are academically capable. You did that both with an upward trend and with a stellar MCAT score. So what was it like to get that first interview invite? Uh, scary. I think um, a lot of times you're, you're aiming for these things, you're, you're, you're hoping for these things, and then when it comes, it's it's it can be a little scary. Uh, <laughs> be careful what you wish for is what they say, but this is a good right. thing. Yeah, and then um, and then I just had to get into prep mode for for the interview. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the interview is is just as important uh, as the application. So yeah, were were there a- anything surprising about the interview process for you? Anything that kind of caught you off guard, or or was it easier than you thought it would? was going to be tell me tell me about that i think this was right in the middle of the pandemic so everybody everything was online right everything was yep. virtual virtual interviewing it requires different skill sets and kind of slightly different planning the biggest thing is every school interviews very differently um i think especially last year because everything was changing um so you have to be trying to be prepared for you know, just be on your feet the whole time and be prepared for what they give you. So um, I also felt I didn't prepare enough for the interview as much as I did for the application. So mm-hmm. uh, prep early, prep, prep often. Yeah. What was it like getting that first acceptance? That was great. That was, uh, I was just like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> I, I got it. Um, everything that I've been working for for the last almost five years has kind of paid off um, and ready for the next step. Yeah. Looking back uh, at your undergraduate career, again, kind of uh, atrocious grades as, as we saw, if someone is in a similar situation to where you were then, what would you say to them to to kind of snap out of it, so to speak? If it's not working, you got to change something. So if you know something's not working, change something. And, and that could be, you know, take a break, um, go work something, work on something that you're passionate about. Um, and then maybe that'll lead you to something else. Um, so instead of trying to power through some some issues, it it, it is good to go around it in a sense. Um, and that'd be my advice. Recognize yeah. your obstacles early, decide whether you can go through. Uh, if not, then go around. 